The Tom Woods Show, episode 2009. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. We're joined once again by University of Milan professor Marco Bassani. And we're going to continue our discussion of his book, which is a great book that will never be assigned in school, which is how you know it's great. Chaining Down Leviathan, The American Dream of Self-Government, 1776 to 1865. So we're going to continue the discussion of nullification and the states versus the federal government, issues like that, moving into the 19th century. So Marco, welcome back. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, my pleasure. We're going to talk more about Chaining Down Leviathan. I want to move into the 19th century. I'll put on the show notes page our last conversation for people who want to hear part one, but Trust me, everybody, you could listen to these independently of each other. The book is an examination of U.S. history through, I would describe it as a Jeffersonian, Federalist, lowercase f, of course, we're talking about the system, not the party, lens. And so when we look at these 19th century events we're going to be talking about, it will be through, let's say, Jefferson sympathetic point of view. So last time we talked about the late 18th century, and uh, we talked about state nullification and states' rights and that tradition in American history. We're going to continue that today. And it's interesting to note, you know, I wrote a book on nullification, as you know, and when Virginia and Kentucky issued the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, there were some states, and I think there were seven of them, that issued their own resolutions saying, you can't nullify a federal law? Why? Of of course, that's not allowed. But then I looked more closely, and it turned out that basically all but one of those states that objected supported the Alien and Sedition Acts that Virginia and Kentucky were nullifying. So of course they're going to be against it. You know, they they wanted to be able to throw journalists in jail. But when you get into the early 19th century, all of a sudden, New England seems a little bit more sympathetic. Can you tell us a little bit of that story? Definitely. Now, I will go over it a little bit. I'm a Jeffersonian with no apology. So the whole book is written in the sort of, I would call it the Jeffersonian tradition in America, if it means something to you or to our listeners. Now, you're right. You know, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, they had um, some answers by several states. Six or seven, that's right. But most of them said, if, there is any breach in individual rights, which in America is impossible because it's such a free country, right? If it happens, <laughs> it will be the Supreme Court that will take care of that. So that was uh, the first answer. And only one state, which was Vermont in 1798, said a very bizarre thing that is the Constitution is the act of the American people, not the peoples of the several states, right? So this was like, it was a very strange thing to say in 1798. No one ever bothered to notice, not even, uh, you know, Jefferson and Madison. The idea that the Constitution was uh, made up by a metaphysical entity like the people of the United States was certainly not there. It was later on, you know, with uh, well, Lincoln, of course, but also Daniel Webster and so on. So this was something created much later on. But the first point would be the idea that the Supreme Court is the arbiter of any conflict between these states or any state and the federal power. Now, what they objected was very simple. They said it cannot be because the Supreme Court is a department of the federal government. So it would be like the federal government telling the federal government what the extent of the powers of the federal government are. Right. So it makes no sense at all to call the Supreme Court as like the arbiter of conflicts or the judge a last resort. You know, this was uh, one thing that was already pretty clear for a lot of Americans, as I've said in, I guess, in your show or in your on your podcast several times, they were against what we call the modern state, that is the politics in a European fashion, that is you put a center of power and it's the ultimate decision maker, the judge of last resort. 
in the American system, according to the states' right tradition and according to the true Federalists and the Jeffersonians, there's no arbiter. There's no final judge. The judge of last resort is the supermajority of the states or the peoples of the various states that can destroy the Constitution. And so clearly not the Supreme Court, but the states, the states and, of course, the single state, the only parts of the convention, the only parts of the ratify the Constitution, the ratifiers, the parties. Well, so when we get into the early 19th century, I do want to say a little something about Daniel Webster, first of all, because when we get to the War of 1812, well, he has a whole speech talking about the importance of state interposition, that the state should interpose between the federal government and the people of the state if it should ever embark on the mad project of attempting to coerce people into the military. So Webster did have some conception of this at that time. Is there any way we can trace out the evolution of his thinking? Because he certainly didn't seem to have this view, you know, 20 years later. That's exactly the point, a very important point you're making. It is, well, there's a chapter in my book, uh, I think it's called something like, the Northeast tried secession. Yeah. And this is the Hartford Convention, something not, not very well known in American history. And uh, it's, it's been, well, all the protagonists of this episode tried to cover it up for several years. And it came out, definitely. You know, they convened during the what was called Mr. Madison's War in uh, 1812, 1814. They convened at a certain point in, in a small town in, in Harvard, and they were like uh, very well-known politicians of the Northeast, the Federalists. That was sort of the end of the Federalist Party. They clearly talked about secession of the Northeast and nullifying and every single decision that was made by the president, James Madison. At that point, they really thought there was like a Virginia dynasty that was sort of ruining in America with the wars and so on. By the way, they were right. Clearly, the War of 1812 is one of the stupidest wars in uh, American history. We know that. But they were right. So when you think about federalism from the Revolution and the Constitution later on to the Civil War, federalism worked a lot, pretty well, on sort of chaining down Leviathan, is the title of my book. And clearly, it was true federalism, authentic federalism was always advocated by the section of the country that felt was paying much of the cost and was supporting the union, right? So it was paying for lives and money, basically, you know, it's lives and money. And in 1812, 13, it was the Northeast, New England. In 1828, 1832, It was actually the South. So the slave states were the fiscal slaves of the North. That's how they felt, at least. I'm not, um, would take a a long time to make the argument clear, but this is how they felt. All right, we got slaves, no doubt about it, but we are the fiscal slaves or the interests of the Union that is working in conjunction with the Northern states, with the Northeast. So that is very important to understand. Every part the two sections, the two big sections of the country. Later on, it would be also the Midwest, right? But two plus one sections of the country that felt the union was not working for the benefit of everyone would advocate true federalism, which also meant nullification and ultimately the right to secede. So let's just go back to the War of 1812 for a minute. What was really going on at the Hartford Convention? The Hartford Convention's in New England, obviously Hartford, but uh, it's made up of people who are unhappy, people who've been unhappy with the federal government for a long time, because even before the War of 1812, they were unhappy about Jefferson's embargo, which obviously hurt their maritime economy, and they were talking about trying to nullify portions of that at that time. But then you get to the War of 1812, and then in 1814, at the end of the year, you have the, uh, the Hartford Convention, and they say that if their demands, which were they had some constitutional amendments they wanted to see ratified, if their demands were not met, they would meet again. And some people have taken that to mean that at that point they would consider secession. What can you tell us about that? The word talks about secession, open talks about secession on the journals and in the gazettes. 
You know, in those days, they were saying, all right, we'll do it by ourselves. In the Northeast, we'll go and we'll form a new confederacy in the North. And that was clearly the talk of the day. It started as early as 1807, 1808, and then it went on. You know, they really felt a crunch of the Virginia dynasty, as it called it, and also the embargo. The embargo was destroying a lot of wealth in the Northeast, in uh, New England. So clearly they had a lot of complaints about the union, about the presidency. The embargo was started in December 1807, and it was the most stupid thing that Jefferson ever did. And it destroyed more than, uh, I would say, 70, 80 percent of the American trade, triggered the most severe economic depression since the revolution. So during the embargo, Massachusetts and the other states, the Northeast, really suffered a lot. And so the point is they were complaining for real things, not only the war. The war came out of nowhere. I mean, officially, the whole thing was impressment. The fact that the British Navy was sort of kidnapping every single port, uh, American citizens, and uh, taking them into the Royal Navy. And so that was um, something that had been going on since the end of the revolution, and nobody cared too much about it. It was only a few people. I mean, it was a very sad thing. But um, so the, the war started, and it was a uh, you know, Northeast, the Northeast was already destroyed by the embargo. So your question is, was there actually a talk of secession? Yes, no doubt about it. In the secret journal of the convention, everything seems clear. There's a talk about nullification, and it says, all right, we will take real measures, and the other real measure is clearly secession as soon as we get together in the next meeting. The only thing is after like two or three months or actually in two or three weeks after the end of the conventions, because it ended in January 1815, then the war was won and it came to an end. So I think it was badly timed. If they had the convention like six or seven months before that, before the 1814, because it started in December 1814, it could have been a success. It could have led to the secession or the Northeast. At that point, you know, since America sort of didn't lose the war, actually won the war. And so the whole thing sounded a little bit like treason. So the point of this, I just want to make clear to everybody, the point of talking about this is to show that ideas like this, that the states had real lives of their own, they had not been absorbed into some indivisible blob, was very much a normal thing in American life. We had already saw it. I mean, there had been the 1798 Virginia-Kentucky resolutions. But then in New England, we also see this kind of talk at the beginning of the 19th century. And then, of course, there's the nullification crisis in South Carolina about 20 years later. That's another thing. We see this sprinkled throughout American history. And it's important to know this because it does matter to us today. It's, It's not the case that the Civil War suddenly means that, you know, that ideas have been defeated. That's a ridiculous notion. But I want to fast forward a little bit just because of the nature of the Tom Wood show. It's, you know, it's not a Joe Rogan show, so I have to right. choose my topics <laughs> very carefully to make the best use of our time. But let's indeed move forward a little bit. And this is a topic. In fact, I don't know if you were at this one, Marco. You and I were at maybe a Clyde Wilson Liberty Fund event on the Virginia Kentucky resolutions, but I was also at one on the Webster Hain debate of 1830. Oh. And incidentally, I forget who ran that one, but There was another debate between Webster and Calhoun a little bit later that's every bit as good as the Webster-Hain debate, but for some reason, history just records the Webster-Hain debate, and it became a debate about the nature of the union, and of course, they're arguing the two competing sides that you've described for us here, that the United States is either a collection of states, each of which has a life of its own and their its own sovereign voice through its people— And the other hand, the Webster view that the United States is a single indivisible whole where the states are sort of useful departments of the central government, but that's all the life they have. Is there anything further to say about the Webster-Hain debates and why they matter? Well, it was the first time, actually, that the Union was presented as a, a nation or something totally different from a union of states, right? So this 
the argument that Webster makes is totally metaphysical. I mean, it's not based on history. It's based on emotions, very clearly. He said, well, you know, Hain or Calhoun, all right? Like Hain was um, just arguing Calhoun's position. That is, it's a compact of sovereign states, and it could be changed by amendments to the Constitution, and everything can be changed. And so it's an artifact to live better between sovereign states. But, uh, you know, there's no American people involved. Now, he's not saying there is the American people behind it from the beginning. Daniel Webster is saying it started exactly as you're saying, no doubt about it. But then it evolved into something very different. Now, the thing is, 20 years before, in the time of the Hartford Convention, at the time of the Hartford Convention, Daniel Webster was pretty much on the side of the, of the Northeasterners who wanted to form a new, a new confederation. So this is like 20 years ago, like he's, he's not saying it clearly, but he means it. Like 20 years ago, it could have been like that, right? A confederation of sovereign states. Now it's over. After 20 years, I am sorry, but it is the union is like a nation to us. So it's really a new thing. There's something else involved, and we are bound together by this union forever, right? This was um, like uh, for the first time, this idea that the union is something like a moral catastrophe, the dissolution of the union was sort of uh, put there to discuss. Of course, it was Abraham Lincoln who started to talk of the union or the dissolution of the union as the ultimate moral catastrophe that could happen to the United States. Well, I want to maybe have a separate episode where we talk exclusively about Lincoln and the events leading up to the war and all that, because, of course, Lincoln is, is just reflecting Webster, but Webster is reflecting nothing. Webster, as you say, I think you're being generous when you call him, uh, well, strictly speaking, it is a metaphysical argument, and that's not meant to be a compliment. It's not rooted in history. And I recall at this, I wish you had been there with us at this Liberty Fund colloquium on the on the webster Hain debates. Oh, yeah. We had people, because this was at a time when Liberty Fund was suddenly deciding that these colloquia were not going to be for libertarian scholars to get to know each and other and interact. they invited some Harvard people, right? Yeah, they started inviting. Was they I thought, well, there? I, maybe I was there. Well, I think they, they also did it at the one, I can't remember which one I, you and I were at, but they had already started at, yeah, at one of Yeah, they started this bizarre idea of inviting people from um, Harvard. and uh, Yeah, and well. so these people, even though we obviously made the best arguments, I will never forget one of them saying that Hayne may have the better of the argument in terms of the facts, but Webster is more poetic. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yes. Talk so about I been there because I remember that too. Okay, you remember that? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I just poetic. Yeah, Talk, talking about rationality and politics and you know constitution yeah. and the poetic. poetic it's term. so absurd. Like, but it on the other absurd. hand, on the other hand, it was a comfort because it made me think. All right, my argument is definitely better. If this is what they have to resort to, that, that's all they've got. And that's exactly it. You know, sentiment always on the side of the union. You know, that doesn't matter like the spectacular lie, as Don Livingston calls it, which is the lie of 1861 by Lincoln, who said it was the union that made the states and gave them that much liberty as they can have, but only through the union. You know, the union is older than the states. There's one thing that the guys that are older or old as we are, almost, still remember in 1982 what we call Reaganomics, now called Reaganomics. It was called the New Federalism, right? Because they wanted to give power, Ron Reagan, at least in the beginning, wanted to try to give power a little bit back to the states. And he said something that to him, it was like very naive, normal, or you know, just he said, well, after all, the states are older than the union. <laughs> and at that point, from Samuel Beer to all the historians, there was a sort of a revolt in uh, 1982 in America, in all the departments of history. You see, they made up a story in which the union is older than the states. And it's accepted in the schools, it's accepted in high school and uh, in the, law the best schools? quarters of academia. 
Yeah, the law schools too. Yeah, the law course. schools make make this thing up and go on and talk about the union that is older than the states. And this is, it's not only sentiments, but it's like the right sentiments. It's a little bit like the PC, the constitutional, politically correct version of America. It doesn't have anything to do with the reality. It's another story. I laid out the compact and nationalist theories of the union in some detail back in episode 1989, which I, I want to refer people to. But also this thing about the union being older than the states, this is like, I think Don Livingston used to say this, but he probably wasn't the only one. This is like saying the marriage is older than the spouses. Yes. You, you know, exactly. that, that is not true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, at the time we were born, we were not mystically married, and then we only came to appreciate it later. Yes. I don't know. There's a distinct <laughs> moment where these things happen. The marriage metaphor is of paramount importance in the political world. And actually, Abraham Lincoln uses it several times when he tells the Southerners, you cannot get out of this marriage. I might forget about my wife, but not about a part of this country. This country is bound together forever. Yeah, that's it. That really is it. And there's no possibility of, of escape, according to this. Because the way that Jefferson looked at it is that if some state wanted to leave the Union, he might think that's a bad decision, but he would say that they had the right to make that decision. And he would say that what's happening here is that the sovereign voice of that state, namely the people of that state, have chosen to exercise their sovereignty in this way, namely withdrawing from the union. Whereas a Webster person who cannot conceive of there being sovereignties within the union would instead of saying, oh, here's a state exercising its sovereignty, they would say, here's an arbitrary assemblage of individuals who are disobeying the federal government. That's the way they think of it. Yes. Actually, Thomas Jefferson was never an unconditional unionist, right? He, he said, well, the union is pretty much an experiment in liberty, but it serves liberty. If it does not, you know, let's, let's find something else. And also, especially like right after the Great Louisiana Purchase, he said uh, there were some people that said, well, it's too far away, it's too big of a country. It will split, they say, because it's simply geography, nothing else. And he said, well, you know, if it happens, I'm not too happy about it, but I will think about the other Americans, the Westerners, as our children. <laughs> you know, just let's have several confederacies. Actually, I will say that um, Thomas Jefferson loved America so much that he wanted several Americans. You know, <laughs> and um, <laughs> that's a good way of thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, and we had no problem with uh, having more Americans in America, in North America, right, at all. Yeah, so, so these, these anti-secessionists are being stingy. They want only one. Yes, they are. I mean, I don't know. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> they are. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Skillshare. Let's stop and think for a minute of what a miracle we're looking at now. We take this all for granted because we live in this amazing technological world. But with Skillshare, you have, with one membership at your fingertips, access to thousands and thousands of classes, each of which can enrich your life by helping you get better in some area of creativity where you're already skilled, or it can help you explore something brand new, help you get yourself out of your comfort zone. And I'm talking about topics like illustration, design, photography, animation, productivity, marketing, entrepreneurship, and more. And if you're the sort of person who gets really excited about something like this and then you start it and you only get 5% of the way through because the thing is so darn big and you have so many demands on your time, that's the beauty of Skillshare. These are micro classes that are super specific that get right to the point, give you exactly what you need and get you on your way. Short lessons, hands-on projects, classes designed for real life. You can tap into the creativity we all have inside. Now, for me, I've just started making my way through Greg McEwen's little class, Simple Productivity, How to Accomplish More with Less. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash Woods, where our listeners get a one-month free trial of premium membership. That's one month free at Skillshare.com slash Woods. We have to mention a particular name, though, now that we were in the 1830s, and you know who this is, the despised John C. Calhoun. Because uh, yes. you, you, know, you spend a good deal of time in your book talking about him, and you know, he's had statues taken down and things renamed. And he's one of the only 
people in America, you know, worth a darn in terms of political thought. So therefore, we have to erase him. But in terms of this conversation, what does Calhoun have to contribute? that's new. I mean, of course, in some ways he's building on Jefferson, but is he saying it in a different way? Is he saying something different? Is he just restating the uh, lowercase f federalist tradition? What's going on with him? Now, I would say that the first, well, there are some differences between, of course, Calhoun and Jefferson, although it seems that the two great minds of the South, right? And it seems also actually they met one time. Uh, Remember that Calhoun was, was born in 1782. And so it could, this could have happened. There's some speculation that they might have met in Monticello at a certain point, but that's besides the point. The point is Calhoun uses the word sovereignty too much or uses it. And Thomas Jefferson never uses the word sovereignty. So I would say Thomas Jefferson is in like also, you know, not only the author of Declaration of Independence, but being from the revolutionary generation, it didn't want to use the European political jargon. And the European political jargon is really based totally on, predicated on the word sovereignty. But this is what in French they call a false friend, because it seems like the same word, souveraineté in French, and sovereignty in English, but in America, it means something else. He used the word sovereignty only to assess the sovereignty of the people of the single state. So he's he's restating the entire state rights tradition, nullification, and so on. So he's really behind the big argument using the Constitution and the super big argument for nullifying the federal laws that exceed the power, the delegated power to the federal power in the Constitution. And actually, he uses the word nullification in 1828, 29, and 31, again, John C. Calhoun. Remember that South Carolina was the first state to actually nullify a federal law, the tariff, and then was the first state to secede. So there's a strong tradition behind this great figure of the slave owner, John C. Calhoun, of rebellion in South Carolina. So there were a lot of Jeffersonians, even Madison told, we went meant something totally different. There are the notes on states' rights and on nullification written by James Madison, 1835, that make no sense at all, actually. If you read the whole document, he was the author of the Virginia Resolutions of um, 1798, but clearly James Madison probably didn't know what was going on because he was uh, pretty much, this was like the Jeffersonian Madison, the one who wrote the Virginia Resolutions. And the other one is the Madisonian Madison. It's uh, very difficult to make sense of him. What I wanted to say is that John Calhoun is really clearly, clearly we stated the whole constitution in terms that will, in due time, would become a matter of the real doctrine of states' rights. And it was probably much more important for secession than defending the peculiar institution of slavery and so on. So there was a real clash of vision of the political community within North and South. Of course, John Calhoun died in 1850, that is 11 years before the Civil War, but he was considered to be the, well, he's just one and the same with the lost cause. Supposedly, there was a Yankee soldier that uh, was just watching the, the South, the destroyed South after the end of the war and said, this is the tomb of Calhoun. Well, I was in Charleston and I can't remember, did they, or was it Savannah? Savannah, I think they actually Savannah. removed a statue. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they removed the statue. And and the tour guide, I think, might be a Calhounian because he seemed annoyed that there was no statue. <laughs> so I thought, I'm not gonna I'm just gonna let the guy lead a peaceful tour. I'm not gonna start anything, even though, you know, that's very much against my I I, I want to start things. That's just how I am as I get older. I, I've actually gotten to be more confrontational than I was when I was younger. And and, and I think on the on the idea that I'm running out of time. I, I have to convince people of things quickly before uh, that's true. Before I yeah, expire. You, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. To John Calhoun, 
the point of the matter was that the theory of so-called divided sovereignty that was advanced by James Madison was totally wrong. That was the outcome and the heart of the constitutional compromise in Philadelphia, and it was the root of all mistakes, all errors. So there can be no doubt about the locus of sovereignty because sovereignty is one, and it's only in the state, and it cannot be in any other area. It's not, I mean, it cannot be in the federal government. It's only one, and it's in the state. And the powers of sovereignty, that's another story, were delegated, some of them, for the common cause, were delegated to the federal government, but never sovereignty itself. So he makes the use of this concept of um, sovereignty, but should not be confused with the European term. The European term sovereignty means for the political community, you build a center, and that is the sovereign center, and every decision stems from that center and, and ends there. And you can delegate powers, but it will recenter every power at a given center at any time. But in sovereignty in the American context and used by Calhoun, it means another thing. It is sovereignty stays with the parties that ratify the Constitution. Before we wrap up, let me ask you, because I think maybe you have a different opinion from mine, and I'm very willing to be persuaded, but the nullification crisis of uh, 1832 to 33 had to do with the protective tariff system that um, it was argued by the nullifiers was unconstitutional. And they they had some arguments to that effect that uh, obviously tariffs are authorized in the Constitution, but that protective tariffs is an entirely different thing because they, they're not aimed at raising revenue, which is what is presumed to be the purpose of a tariff in the Constitution. And so anyway, they whether they had the stronger the argument is certainly debatable, but whether they had the right to nullify it because they they were claiming it was unconstitutional. The idea of nullification is that you, you don't just nullify things you don't like. You have to be able to make a constitutional argument. And when that crisis ended, well, what was the result? I mean, some people say, well, this just goes to show that nullification doesn't work. But on the other hand, they got the so-called tariff of abominations gradually eliminated. So how is that not in fact a victory for the nullifiers. And and when I read your book, you were suggesting that because of the language used in the force bill of Andrew Jackson, that the kind of scope of power contemplated in the force bill was a very, very bad step in American history. And it kind of, I got the sense you were saying that maybe it showed that the nullification effort had backfired. Well, when you talk about veto powers, right? So let's put this in, in general terms. Right, nullification is pretty much a veto power of the state. The state says, uh, well, they called it sometimes also the shield, right? You're shielding your citizens from the harshness of the federal government, right? So any measure from the federal government that is unconstitutional, you have to make the point that it's not within the, the delegated powers in the Constitution. That's clear. But then you sort of shield your own your community, your people from the effects of that. So it does not exist limited to your territory. And so Calhoun said, well, maybe for the other states, it is so important, that measure, that they want to put it in the Constitution. So let's see, they could do that. They have a constitutional convention and that with the supermajority that can do whatever they want with the Constitution will change things. At that point, the state that nullified is not forced into a new constitution because they have to either to approve or not to approve it or ratify the new constitution. So at that point, they're pretty much free to do what they like because it's a new constitution. But so the force bill, in a certain sense, was a compromise. And the feat of power is there, according to Calhoun, but to every other person who just claimed that there should be veto powers, veto of a major interest in a political community, in a larger political community, put a veto in order to reach a compromise. And actually, there was a compromise. Although, you know, as the force bill is there, it says, you're not totally wrong. We'll concede something. We'll give something. We'll give a little to you. And we'll make concessions, which is politics, but politics in federal sense. As I said, you know, in the European monarchical sense, or a parliament. You have a center of power, a monarchy or a parliament. In the American sense, you have compromise between states, federation, several other states. And so the veto power, ultimately, it 
will bring a compromise. This was uh, what Calhoun said several times, because all the arguments that are made by nowadays political scientists about veto power and nullification were already made in the 1830s and were answered by Calhoun, who said, at the end, we will find a compromise. Well, this was until the end of his life, 1850, when 1848 or something, he realized that it was almost impossible to keep the union together only with the force of the Constitution and the right interpretation of the Constitution. So at that point, he came up with the disposition of government that was published posthumously in 1851, and also with the discourse on the government and the Constitution of the United States, in which he thought about a dual executive, that is, two presidents, one for the South, the other one from the North, so they could reach a compromise every day, right? Two people cannot vote. It's like a real marriage. That would be a real marriage with uh, two equals. Well, let's stop there because I would want at this point to then move into the coming of the war. And as I say, I think it would be best to have that as a separate episode unto itself. So if I can prevail upon you at some point in the future we'll come on and continue the conversation into that episode of American history. So Definitely. having said that, excellent. All right. Well, I, plus I knew I could even, if I had to, I'd guilt you into doing it somehow. But <laughs> the, the, the book is Chaining Down Leviathan, The American Dream of Self-Government, 1776 to 1865 by our guest Marco Bassani. And I'm linking to it at tomwoods.com slash 2009. So Marco, thank you for the conversation. But the... I wouldn't say, I don't know if we should say the final chapter because you can always revive this tradition. And I think the COVID period of American history shows that there is still a somewhat vibrant federalist tradition even now in America, stronger than I thought. So there is more to say, but a major chapter, we'll say, is still to come in a future episode of the show. So thanks again. Definitely. It would be a great chapter, COVID and federalism. Yeah, yeah, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right, well, we'll make that happen. Thanks again, Marco. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. All right, folks, before we go, a couple quick notes about past and future episodes. You have to listen to episode 2001. You know, sometimes I have really good episodes and I think to myself, there's no good title for this episode that's going to make people really want to listen. They're going to skip this one. I've got to come up with a really good title and I can't always. Now, sometimes I have a great episode and I come up with just a killer title and it just works. And so everybody listens. Sometimes the topic is so interesting that even with a lousy title, people will listen. But the really bad spot is when it's a great episode the world needs to hear. But on the surface of it, it sounds like a topic they're not going to be interested in. So Clifton Duncan, the Broadway actor I interviewed, you might think, well, I don't care about Broadway or I don't care about acting or this or that. Or why would I want to listen to an actor? I am telling you, you're going to thank me. Go back right now and listen to episode 2001 if you haven't already. I place it in the top five ever, and I've done 2,000 of these. Secondly, tomorrow's episode, number 2010, is another one where I don't know if I'm going to be able to come up with a really good title, but I am telling you this is a great, great conversation. I mean, I just could not possibly be happy with it. I became instant friends with the guest whom I had never spoken to before on the show tomorrow. So that's Ken McCarthy. And you can just Google the name Ken McCarthy. He is considered to be the godfather or at the very least one of the godfathers of, of internet marketing who recognized the commercial potential of the internet far earlier than really anybody else. And he was recognizing it shortly before the ridiculous Paul Krugman was saying, well, we're going to find that the internet had no more effect on the economy than the fax machine. Remember that remark? So I, in fact, I ask him in, in our conversation, I say, uh, so what did you see that Paul Krugman didn't see? <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's a great, great discussion. So please, 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 episodes 2001 and 2010, even if they don't sound like your typical episode and they're going to pull you out of your comfort zone a little bit, just do me a favor. The old man here knows good episodes when he hears them after 2,000 of them, make sure and check those out. Just do that as a favor for Woods. And then it's a favor that after you do it, you're going to be glad you did it. Okay, thanks everybody. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time.
Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.